Thank you so much. Okay, yeah, yep. emotional reaction isn't something that you necessarily want to ha have for something because I don't want to make anybody feel uncomfortable, you know, I want, I want it all to be a 
safe and loving place in, you know, sometimes if I'm the one who's like, whoa, you're going to be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, um, <laughs> but, but those moments are, um, amongst so many other precious moments, th those little drops of precious care and tenderness from people from all over the world are just, we live for that, you know, and it means so much. So I want to thank you for those, those gifts that you've given us. Thank you. <laughs> say you're my favorite bad guy in the entire game. So <laughs> I think I would <laughs> <laughs> any other uh, particularly interesting gifts that you got uh, in the last couple days that you need to work. I saw I saw some really great stuff come to the table. Anything else come to mind? Uh, I think I think we all each got one. Someone had uh, given us little stickers or little red hearts. And on it, it said, I think Tahiti was the friend's name along the way. <laughs> now, I, I know that whenever you, uh, whenever you work on, on a film set or you know something where you have actual physical props, costumes, and things like that, off, actors oftentimes have gone with you know, some of the, the, the parts of these stories. Is there anything that you guys took home from from work on Red Dead or something. Anything like that. That, that we've stolen. Yes. <laughs> 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 Allegedly. 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 <laughs> did anything go missing from set? Anything that Rockstar gave you? Something that's sitting on your shelf at home that reminds you of home? No. <laughs> <laughs>
friends, and I was shocked when he was in there in the room working with us. Unfortunately, during the making of this, John passed away. So to see him eulogized but in that way by Rockstar was just really touching, and that really kind of took me back when I played the game. So that was another real kind of just a lovely kind of moment, I suppose. And the wonderful thing about John, how much blood about losing it, but he had recorded all of Uncle's singing and they got to preserve his performance. So he's not Uncle for dialogue. All of John's work is still preserved in the game. And I'm in the screen box. They said that. Yeah. 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 Now I know uh, several of you are, are gamers. Is, are there any any particular Easter eggs or things that you think that we might have missed, or things that you love to, that they kind of stuck into the game? I know uh, uh, Rob. I think you there's a particular Easter egg in Red Dead One that has something to do with some you know it was a little personal influence that you tossed in there. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll bring it up later. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. But like I said, yeah, any, any particular any Easter eggs in there that you guys who were gamers that you were enjoying, uh, enjoy finding, hunting down? Yeah, um, there's. I I have not yet, at least at any of the like at this event or the cons um, that I've been to, encountered anyone uh, to uh, who's found this scene uh, oh, that is between Micah and. Uh, uh, Dutch. <laughs> in the, I think it's the second uh, second chapter, where if you go behind this certain tree and camp, it cuts to this. No, it's true. It cuts to this cutscene, and they're laughing because it's a beautiful scene. And, um, it goes to a cutscene where Micah and Dutch have this beautiful um, slow dance. <laughs> There's sort of a light mist in the air, uh, and you hear the crickets going, um, and the mist kind of moves across, and the rest of the uh, gang members are asleep, and Micah and Dutch are just enjoying a beautiful, beautiful dance together. <laughs> no one's found that yet. So, uh, keep looking. <laughs> you, you know he's telling the truth. When Micah approaches Dutch and says, You're amazing, you know, it's totally amazing. <laughs> That's how you know you're on the right track. Uh, so, for those, of you who, <laughs> for those of you who were in uh, Red Dead 1 and then moving into Red Dead 2, how, how did your, the development of your character, how did you, what, what changes did you make personally, things that you wanted to carry forward, any influence you had on that? Uh, as far as Bill Williamson goes, um, you Bill plays a, 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 I mean, he's the impetus as far as John going out and, and, and searching, but the, the, as far as actual springtime, he, he really has very little. Um, and, and what I went in, in, in read it to knowing that was going to be a prequel, I'm thinking, we can really flesh this guy out. And I know that he had a jealousy and a, and a rage towards John. Sorry,
going to go specifically, and that was exciting. One thing I did know is uh, I knew that uh, as far as making it, I was like, well, whether we shoot this thing in order or out of order, uh, Ben, Rob, and myself are going to make it to the end, so we're going to have work for a while. <laughs> um, but it just, uh, it, it, it's just hard to say. It, it just, I, I didn't really know the grand scope of what Red Dead Redemption 2 is going to be until we just having a great time and then you realize, wait a minute, two years is not enough. And then, you know, you, you talk to someone like the director of Rod Edge or someone else and like, yeah, we're nowhere near done. And, and this is just, it's, it's just, it's like an epic novel. And so we're just getting, you know, getting things, you know, piecemeal. Like the, the first question, as far as something you stuck out, I remember the day I got the script and, I, and the scene where Bill's eating dinner at the table with Micah and, and Micah asks about his name and the reveal that Bill's real name is Marion Williamson. And I re remember getting that and like grabbing Ben, I go, look at this, and I think that was amazing. And what what that would lead to as far as you know, or the campfire stories and and, and you know where is Bill's coming from, and it, it it makes the events of the original game just so much more impactful. So I, you know, but it, it, just doing it, it was just such a great experience. But I didn't necessarily know where things were going to go. It's like, well, I, I have interactions with Sean McGuire, I have interactions with Telly, but. It's like, well, they're, they're not in the original game, so what happens to them? How does, we know what, we know how it's going to end up. What's the journey from A to Z? And, uh, and just as it, we just took it as it unfolded, and it kind of was like the very beautiful thing that happened. Did you guys draw any uh, inspiration from like historical figures or any other fictional characters throughout the Western canon for any of the characters you portrayed in the, in the story? Well, <laughs> There, there are real concrete similarities between the Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and the, the whole new ball game. Right. Uh, up to and including escaping America. Uh, so, how much you draw from that? I, I almost did it myself. I couldn't draw too much. The one thing, Dutch loved Edwin Miller. And I kept reading his quotes about Edwin Miller. And I was trying to be really a really studious actor. And I think I'm pretty well read, but I couldn't remember the philosopher at the middle. So I started looking at the library online. I called friends who were philosophers, and I asked them, "Do you know Evelyn Miller? Who this person is?" And I finally reached out to Rockstar. I was like, "I can't find Evelyn Miller anywhere." But I could tweet, "We made him up." It's like, oh, that explains. So a lot of you worked in theater film, television, other audio aspects. What, what's, what's your favorite thing about working in motion capture versus any of these other uh, mediums that you've worked in? I feel like we're about to say. Yeah, maybe we're about, well, you're not the same thing. That. The people? Oh, oh not the people. I, 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 the people. <laughs> I, well, here's what I was going to say, is that uh, I had no idea what it was going to be like shooting, but, but Yes, I've done a lot of theater, a lot of film, a lot of television. I had never done this kind of work, and I didn't know what to expect. The player can enter from anywhere, right? So every scene has to be shot from every angle. So there are cameras 360. You're being shot. Well, that is like doing theater in the round, which for an actor is special because even your back is out because they might be behind you. At the same time, there's a camera close up on your face in a tight close-up. So your face acting has to be filmic. It's, it's specific, it is measured, and it is seen and felt fully. But everything is play pretend. So if Susan climbs on a horse, that is a structure built to the size and scale of a horse, but I'm going like this. And if Susan is smoking a cigarette, it is an actual straw, because the animators fill it all in. So it's like you're doing this theater work, this film work, and like you're a little kid playing on a horse and playing pretend. So for me, to incorporate all of those different styles of work that I've dedicated my life to, I, I mean, it, it blew me away in how fulfilling it was. 
And people. <laughs> <laughs>
but we never really knew, and we were like kind of curious. Even when we did ADR, like we were doing anything in the booth, they would have created a, a new version of us, and so um, that's not really. I, don't, I can't think of any other format of how, how we perform that that ever happens because some, you know, the visual of like your awareness and being in your body as an actor. A lot of us really tend to use everything about the way we look to you know add to our performance. So. You're kind of like, okay, cool, you guys can do whatever you want. Like, similar to what Gabrielle is saying, like, there's just all these limitless things happening that I was surprised I told uh, somebody at my table today that, and she was like, what? And I was like, yeah. So when I got to see Karen, I was like, damn, hey, Karen, looking good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, thanks. Everyone in Red Bull's Karen. I was going to add one thing for all of us. I mean, when you go to, when you book a gig, normally you have like hair, makeup, wardrobe, da, 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 in the morning, and then you're in your own trailer, and then you kind of sit, and you wait for your time, and you're not with, it, not really with anybody that you're going to be acting with, none of that is the process, so there is no hair, there is no makeup, there isn't any of that, you come in as you are, pressed in your eyes, just woke up, like bring a toothbrush, maybe your breath stinks, I don't know, but like, you don't have any of that other, those other layers that add to the creativity of being an artist, being an actor, none of that's there. So when we were doing it, it really was like bare bones because it felt like rehearsals all the time, right? As an actor, we have rehearsal. We're not really always in our get up, you know? We have pieces, so we have the boots, we have the hat, we have, people have their holsters and things like that, but mainly we are ourselves, our faces have no makeup on them. Ladies, do you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> Early in the morning, you know what I mean? And that is, it puts you in perspective of humbling yourself, but also puts you in the perspective of your power. Like, I don't need all of that to really bring my grade A behavior, grade A acting. So, yeah, that's it. So, working, working in all of these somewhat immediately built environments for you, how, how, how restricted were you to the script, or was there a lot of freedom for improv. Is there anything that we saw throughout it that may have just been you reacting to, you know, stumbling over a clip in Guarma or anything like that? Uh, the owner of the company wrote the script, so <laughs> you don't mess with the script. There'd be movies that would show up and say, how tight the, won't you want this up? <laughs> See, here's the unemployment one. <laughs> I, I would say one thing about that. Um, I, found, I found the director, especially, was very open to hearing my own suggestions as a character that was from another place. So if something was written a certain way, you know, if I had something that might just sound a little bit more authentic, then they were pretty good about you know going with that. But yeah, you want to stick to the script as much as possible. Yeah. Uh, that brings us to the halfway point. I'm going to open the floor up to some Q&A, so if you guys have any questions. Hello, I have a question for Mr. Peter Blomquist. So in chapter four, if you're snooping around Shady Bell, you can find a letter that Micah received from his brother Amos. It's, the way that it's phrased implies that Micah had written him first. And uh, his brother really just does not like him, it seems. What would compel Micah to write his brother, and what kind of relationship did they have together? <laughs> uh, that's a great question. Uh, so, uh, I think uh, Micah had a, a rough childhood. As, as uh, I think is uh, explained in one of the campfire, at least one of the campfire uh, sequences. Uh, and Amos, as I recall, right, ends up um, living, having a family, and has somehow gotten out of a life of crime, uh, away from his, uh, his um, uh, outlaw father, and is living with his family by the sea, as, as I recall, right? Um, but, uh, so, I don't exactly know, um, I can't really answer what, what kind of, what would have prompted Micah to uh, reach out to Amos, other than 
um, to express his undying love <laughs> for his beautiful brother. Um, there's another sort of hidden scene that I don't think anyone has found. <laughs> That where Micah well, talks for about like a good 15 minutes about how much he admires his brother's um, like uh, skin, <laughs> uh, hair, his um, clothing. Um, so I think he, he admires his brother a lot. Um, but why he would have reached out to him, I'm not exactly sure. I can't really answer the question 100%, but it probably has to do with his, um, I don't know, smooth skin <laughs> and his perfect hair. <laughs> all right, first of all, I just want to say thank you. I'm sure we can all agree on this amazing game that you've made. It wouldn't be possible without any of you, and I just want to thank you. Um, I had to write this down because I've been thinking about it this whole time. It took me 15 hours to get here. So, um... <laughs> Part of my identity that I didn't even know I was missing. Um, it's inspired me to look into real history and like my family's history because I come from a western town but I never looked into it and there's so many cool stories that give me a part of myself that I didn't know I was missing and um, I'm an artist and it's inspired my art. I started writing a book based like not based on you guys but I wrote my own western book because of it. Has working on this game been anything similar for you guys in that regard? And if so, how? If you don't mind, I'd like to just say that working on this game, I've been exposed to the fandom and people like you, especially during the pandemic and seeing the outpouring of creativity from the community with your podcasts, with your art, with everything that you've given back to us has been a surprise and has also been really inspiring. So. But that's, yeah, that's, that's what I would say to that. I, I'd like to answer that too. I, first of all, congratulations and thank you. And yeah, I, playing this role did, playing a middle-aged character who is allowed, a middle-aged woman who is allowed to be cranky, who is allowed to be bossy, who is allowed to be vicious and still has value in this, in this gang and that and that people like you all will come up and tell me that you love Susan's loyalty. That is a big risk for a video game company. That is not how women my age are normally portrayed. And so to get to bring out all that crankiness and that bossiness and hold that kind of power that Susan has and not worry that everyone will hate her, uh, that, that was a real revelation for me. Oh my god, 
I just rubbed it, right, you know? <laughs> so, to me, I'm like, I think she hit rock bottom and turned it all around, and she's out there doing good stuff. So.
John. <laughs> Someone the Dutch is ever going to turn to as an advisor, with respect. <laughs> and Arthur is too much of a uh, son to Dutch for Dutch to be able to listen to any doubts from mm -hmm. Arthur. But Lenny, who is Curzon's protege, is seen multiple times in the day. Uh, disagreeing with Dutch, and Dutch can accept it. So the fact that Dutch loses Hosea and Sean, and Hosea and Lenny on the same mission, by the way, the mission that Dutch didn't believe in, that Hosea told him was a good plan. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm going to pass the baton. Keep on with it. Even though we fight and squabble and bitch at each other most of the time, you know, um, there's there's this, this tight connection between us, and we trust each other completely and rely on each other. And I, I love the way Dutch is often almost always asking for my opinion, even though he rarely responds to it. <laughs> Jolly get this sort of cheating out of things. So 
So a lot of my scenes were, were sort of intimate uh, two hundred things, whether it was with uh, Lenny, which I really enjoyed, you know, teaching John to get out of being, and especially with Dutch. I think those were my favorite scenes in the world. Two, the the intimacy, you know, the quiet time that we just spoke to. Those were my favorite. The campfire scenes are fun. The weird the weird thing for me, and, and I think for many of the actors who this for the first time in the campfire scenes, is being told by but the director, now don't look there, because there, there, there probably will be no one there. There may be someone there, or you know, someone there now, but Arthur could be behind you, you know, and, and try to manage all this when you're at a big campfire scene and, and you realize that there may only be one person listening to me and they're probably asleep. So, <laughs> I'm not going to play, play this. That was, uh, that was the challenge. But my favorite scene was the end of it, uh, back and forth. I have, I have one question it's, uh, from one of Alex's brilliant fans. Um, if you're here, this is your question. I have to ask it. It's so good. Uh, if you could come up with your character's theme song, what would that song be so that we can put together the ultimate playlist? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, one last round of applause. 